Hey everyone, uh, welcome to Film Trooper Presents Film Marketing Fridays. I am your host, Scott McMahon, and I will be, um, what you gonna call it? I think I'll have a filmmaker joining me soon here, um, all the way in uh, Ireland or England. I'll, I'll, I'll have to clarify. I think it says the UK, but I think he's up in Ireland, or at least he shot his film up in Ireland. Um, but in the meantime, he, uh, this particular filmmaker, his name is Tom Wadlow, if I pronounce his name, name correctly, he'll tell me. But uh, he had made this really, really cool looking sort of zombie film. And he runs a production company as well. And, you know, a, a lot of people do that where they have a production company or doing freelance work. But on the side, they all of us, all we really want to do is just make our movies and make a living out of it. But a lot of people just, you know, it's very difficult just to make a living just by you know by just doing your films and even the big guys like even the ones that we see as like academy award winners and such um they make you know a lot of their money doing commercial work or freelance work and that kind of stuff but you know i think things can change and that's what we're going to try to address here on film marketing fridays so tom had to uh, tom had 10 questions that he had sent me and I want to get through them all because there are some really uh, great questions that I think all of you are probably thinking of uh, on your on your own. So we'll just get to it. We'll get right on to the uh, presentation here. So I click over here. You should be able to see that. Okay, cool. Let's get on his first question, <laughs> which is a great question is like, okay, what is the best time to start marketing? Well, that kind of leads into this bigger question, which is fast, cheap, good, and just pick two. And the, the, <laughs> the reason this is that way, as I click over back to my mug here, my face, um, it's an old saying like in client service relationships, you know, fast, cheap, or good, you got to pick two. Um, so a lot of independent filmmakers, the uber independent filmmakers out there, you know, they have very limited uh, money to do what they need to do. Um, so it's going to be cheap. So we know at least that's one of the parameters. And if they want to make it really good, they can't go fast. So where Hollywood, you know, has uh, the resources, right? They have the money. So they know they can go, if they want to make something good um, and they want to go fast, they know it's not going to be cheap. So they have to spend a lot of money to do so. So that goes back to the main question of like, when do you start your marketing? Well, ideally everyone tells you to like all the experts say like, oh, you gotta start it like right away or even before you even make your product. There's a whole movement in terms of the startup um, uh, business culture, online business culture, which is you start vetting your audience or your customer base because you wanna really know what kind of product you can create for them that is going to serve their needs, and you do that early in the initial sort of product, you know, customer relationship uh, building. And so the same thing can be applied to filmmaking as well with your audience, which is why all the experts say, you know, you got to know your audience, you got to build your audience, and all that stuff kind of happens at first, at the first part um, before you even make your product. I mean, that's the ideal situation. But the reality for most of us out there, like me, you know, when I made this film here, the Cube, I knew I was going into it all wrong. But there's this sort of creative need that you just got to like barf something out, you know? And so sometimes you just make something and you're like, okay. Because you, the problem is we hear a lot of stories about successful um, filmmakers or, or we hear about all those underdog stories where somebody just made something, you know, in their garage and then the whole world, you know, embraced it and they, you know, became rich and famous or what whatnot. Um, you know, there is that need and it has to be... A, acknowledge that the creative process is not very linear it's very messy and sometimes as a creative person you just got to get something out so if that happens and you're like okay well then all right i made something but then how do i market it you know if i didn't start at the beginning then what do i do well you have to have your expectations in um you know basically in check and so let's go on to the next question so to answer that particular question when do you start your marketing ideally yeah you'd start it at way before the beginning of any of your, um, you know, projects. And, um, you know, for instance, you know, like I said, I made this film all wrong. 
However, if you head over to my YouTube channel or just go over to filmtrooper.com, I've started a video series called How to Make a Movie, a Film Trooper Case Study. And I'm literally going through step by step, applying all these things the experts are telling us to do for my next feature film. So, you know, hopefully I'm starting this process early where I'll be doing the marketing or the audits, the audits, the audience um, research and apply all these things they tell us to see if it actually works or, you know, to how, how badly I fail at it or, you know, have some success. So let's go to the next question. All right. This is not the most smoothest thing, but you can see. Okay. So the next question is, with so many social media platforms, how do you maintain a solid plan? And um, I'm going to skip to the next slide because I, I think I have the answer. I don't remember. Hold on. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I forget what I wrote. Okay, so we're going to pick one platform. You know, because again, the question was, with so many social media platforms, I mean, how do you maintain a solid plan? Like, how do you just not just get overwhelmed by too many options? Well, let's pick, just pick one plan, one platform. And the one platform you're going to pick is where your targeted targeted audience engages on. And you do this by, you know, your research or um, the metrics and so on. Like, for instance, the, the, the zombie film that Tom made, you know, where are people having the most discussion about zombie films, you know, and a lot of it may be on Facebook um, because The Walking Dead has created such a, you know, a fanaticism about uh, that show and also just zombies in general. So if you're going to pick one platform, you might go, okay, so I'm going to go all in on Facebook, you know, but what happened if there's multiple platforms, right? If there's more than one, uh, then you got to pick the one that you enjoy most. So you might actually enjoy being on Twitter more than you are on Facebook or, you know, vice versa, my Instagram, Tumblr, whatever you're choosing is because you're trying to get the best bang out of, you know, for your buck, being that you might have limited resources. Okay. This uh, third question was, well, how do you make changes when things aren't working? So that's a really interesting question because um, in sort of the world of business, they've got this whole thing about called, you know, pivoting. It's, it's, it's famous for this book um, from a Eric Reese called The Lean Startup. And the concept there is that it, it was intended for, you know, tech startups, you know, making uh, app programs or software development and so on like that was that you build sort of a, he calls it, you build the MVP, the minimum viable product. And the idea here is just enough of a product that works that your audience can give you feedback or your customer base can give you feedback. And, but then during the process, you know, you might go down a rabbit hole thinking that the product or the, the whatever you're creating is, you know, going to be this one thing, but then you have to pivot and change based off the feedback you're getting. And so that's sort of this question of like, how do you make changes when things aren't working? I mean, in terms of your marketing campaign, like, man, I put all this stuff together. I've got a new poster. I got a new trailer. I'm hitting the social media. Um, it's just, but I'm not getting the responses. You know, how do I change things up? Well, the, also in the marketing world, they talk about AB uh, split testing, meaning that, um, they do it a lot to, to test out like copywriting headlines or the way the article set up. So you might not literally have two of the same posters. Like, so I might have this poster here, but the heading or the headline that I put on my social media post might be completely different. For instance, like, you know, Hey, check this out. That might be the headline for, uh, one of my posts or as opposed to like warning, whatever you do, do not watch this film. So you can imagine if you had two headlines like that and you split tested them, like which one would probably get more engagement? Everybody's yelling at us all the time to like, hey, check this out, check this out, that it's just become like spam. It's this noise versus, you know, if somebody prompted you to be curious about something as you know ridiculous as warning, don't watch this film because you're trying to bait people to watch it, you actually might have better results. Uh, so you know, there might be minor changes that could be made with the already artwork or the marketing campaign stuff you've already created that can show results uh, or get reaction. And it's just part of the process. It's messy. I think that the creative process of making a film is messy as just as much as a marketing, you know, campaign or plan is. It's, it's just not uh, necessarily, um, you know, 
a linear, like we're going to start here. We should expect to get this type of results. They try to as much as possible, but the way things are going with social media, you just don't know. You have to be really flexible, and I and it is going to be messy. So that's why you just got to be ready for it. The roller coaster ride, you know. Okay, so here we go. Uh, let's go back to the next question. Do, 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 do. Okay, everybody can see that. All right, so next question is, well, how do you get results with limited resources? Ah, oh, that's just the biggest, you know, question that daunts all of us uh, uber independent filmmakers. Okay, let me see what I wrote for the next slide. Okay, and the big thing here is defining expectations. So if you have limited resources, you know, then you have to, you can't judge yourself against the big Hollywood studios or the mini, mini majors or just even like uh, independent films that are being talked about in the press, in the blogosphere. You know, you probably don't have the same resources to match what they're doing. So you have to redefine uh, your expectations. And so, how do, what does that mean, you know, and, and how do you deal with that type of thing? Let me see what the next slide is real quick. Okay, so we'll go back to defining expectations. Um, yeah, so defining expectations, you know what, I think this question, uh, uh, this answer to this question is going to be further down in the other questions. So let's just keep going. So going back, if you have limited resources, you know, how do you get results? It starts off with defining your expectations and then moving forward to really answer this particular question is we can we'll go further and I'll, I'll answer it later on here how much time do you put into a campaign before seeing results again that comes back to that whole um, analogy of fast cheap or good you know when you're looking at like well, gosh how much time am I gonna put into pumping this you know marketing this film like this one you know it but it, this is this thing's going on like a year and a half now and I have to make that decision of like you know how much do I keep marketing you know before I get on to the next project and just sort of let this thing die um, however I've set things in place online to try to create what they call like an evergreen system so that people you know four years down the line may be able to find material or marketing material or uh, intrigue about this particular film that I had made uh, down the line and then you might see results come you know come to fruition you know three four or five years down the line you expect and sort of that's why like working with a film distribution company we'll get into it later because there's a question about that um, you know they, they kind of want a, a film title or these these in their library for like sometimes 10 15 25 years they, they want that control of that license so they can do have better chance of cashing in on it over the long term so you know how much you put into a campaign before you're seeing results um, it depends how passionate you are about the particular product your film product you know I know I know a lot of filmmakers out there are like you look I just made this one I'm just it took took everything I had to make it and I'm done with it I don't even want to deal with it anymore I just want somebody else to just take it and you know do all the work to market and sell it I just I'm done with it I want to move on to the next project um, which is really difficult in today's world now. I mean, think about if you're uh, an independent author writing ebooks, or you're a music musician, you're a band. You know, you're trying to put, you know, pump out your music, and then you probably get sick of your the best selling song that you have, or playing it every day, or something like that. You just want to get onto the next album. That's just sort of the natural um, progression for any creative person. But you have to understand those expectations or define those expectations. And so moving forward, if you have to ask that question of like, well, how much time do I put into a campaign? You know, as as much as you can. I mean, if you're only by yourself or a small team, you have to be realistic in those expectations of, you know, our stamina. How long can we, you know, move forward and 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 based off our campaign of what we're trying to do, like how many sales are we trying to get? Or if it's not the sale, like you're you just want to use the movie to get level up to have an opportunity to work with somebody else or or you know or get the money for the next film is really what the mentality is. But we'll move forward here and um see if we can't address some of these other questions that you know even though it's 10 questions, it's it kind of all all funnels into like the same sort of mindset and strategy. Oh, hey, I think I'm going to have uh, Tom here. Hey, Tom. Hi. 
<laughs> Hello. I finally got it working. Oh, no problem. Hey, welcome. Welcome to Film Marketing Fridays, and it's wonderful to meet you in person, or you know, via online. I know we've been talking uh, through emails, you know, yep. prior to this. So, um, I've been telling people about the uh, your film uh, a little yep. bit, but I haven't shown it just yet. And I've been going through your questions, and I think I'm at like question four or five right now. Okay. But um, we can backtrack a little bit more and have more of a you know a one-on-one -on -one dialogue to make sure that. Uh, I'm doing whatever I can to help curate the best answers uh, for you. Okay. So sweet. Why don't you, if you can, if you're ready, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, where you're based out of, and uh, a little bit about you know, your company. Uh, okay, yeah. Um, uh, we're based in uh, the middle of the UK, um, a place called Derby, which is sort of pretty much central uh, England. Um, we do corporate films uh, that kind of help tide us over, um, and then the money that we make from those, we reinvest into films that we make. Um, so we've got complete control over all of our projects. It's so very nice. Back. Yeah, it's really nice. I want to show people a little real quick, just so they know what we're talking about here. Uh, I'm going to okay. share this screen real quick with, uh, where is it? Here it is. So you should be able to see this, and everybody else should be able to see this. Okay. Um, here you go. You see that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's your that is your company, Light Films. Yeah. Yeah. And in this particular film, uh, this is just like a, a a thumbnail for the your feature film Wasteland, yeah. um, which was looks looks beautiful. It looks really cool. And again, from a, you know an American bloke, it's just the uh, uniqueness of all the 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 accents and the locations yeah. looks exotic for you know for yeah. Americans because there's a huge. You know, my family's a huge, you know, Doctor Who fan base, so they okay. love anything that that has to do with, the, you know, the British accents or Irish accents or Scottish accents. You know, they love yeah. all that stuff. So. <laughs> yeah, no, it's uh, it's kind of funny because um, a lot of the accents in there are um, native Derby accents. Um, and um, do you know an actor called Jack O'Connell? That sounds familiar. Uh, uh, he's been in um, Angelina Jolie's uh, Unbroken. Ah, okay. Yeah, and, um, Angelina Jolie actually uh, a ceremony or something did um, uh, uh, went a up me duck. I don't know if you saw that. It, it was pretty. It went viral over here. But that was like a like a pretty um, local saying in Derby. So that's kind of uh, something <laughs> Derby seems to be in, on on the filmmaking map a little bit. Interesting. Now, how big is you? You were mentioning. It, one of your questions, I don't necessarily get into it because I, I narrowed it down to ten. But the the eleventh okay. que the eleventh question you would ask me later was, um, getting more enthusiasm or reaching out to the local uh, community or the people in town to get excited yeah. about the film. How big is Darby? Or you know, uh, it's small. Metro? I mean, it's it's technically a city, but it's it's under a million people. So in fact, okay. it's probably under half a million people. So it's it's pretty small. Um, and it, but it's one of the problems I find in England is it's difficult to once you've sort of everyone in that area has seen it, it's difficult to kind of get out of that area into another area to, yeah. to see for people to see it and find the project. Okay, okay, so it's cool because I think I have some, you know, based off your questions and stuff like that, I think I've got some stuff that um, you know we could address that kind of um, answer a little bit more in depth about your specific case. Okay. So. Um, Real quick, let me just, uh, I'm going to jump back over here into the slide share, um, and you tell me, like I said, um, I'm at this question right now, which is how much time do you need to put in a, a campaign? I know that you were um, rushing to get over because you were telling me about the bad weather, that you're at the hotel, yeah. there's all this crazy stuff going on. <laughs> but let me see, I'm going to jump back to, I'll just start back on uh, slide number two. Boom. Okay, so I had to you know an answer this a little bit about what is the best time to start marketing, and you know the experts say you got to start like ahead of time. But I was trying to express that I get it. You know, as filmmakers, there are cases where you just make something, and now you're like, okay, now what do I do with it? I mean, I think yeah. that's a, a reality that people um, face all the time. You know, yes, in the ideal situation, if you could start your marketing ahead of time, that's great. But I think the the big question too. Is um, you know what is marketing? I mean, it's kind of like 
um, we're all marketing all the time. You know, if you're yeah. on a date or even dealing with, you know, discussing with, you know, having a conversation with your wife, you know, you're trying to, if you, you're planning to do something, there, there's a little bit of a, a head start of like um, spreading the message or planning the message so that you can get a result. You know, in, in yeah. marketing, in marketing is really just a, a method of communication to get a result. And so, being clear about what those results are in each stage—that's um, all that really marketing is. Um, but anyhow, so yeah, yeah, the experts tell us to start early, but sometimes you don't have that. It, as in the case, like even with my film, like I didn't believe me. I, I finished. I'm like, okay. What do I got here, and what do I do? You know, and that's how Film Trooper was created. Yeah. I needed a platform to share these ideas or enthusiastically talk about film marketing and online entrepreneurship. And in conjunction, I knew this was just a, a, a side thing. You know, in terms of that, I could talk about. It. I had something to point to, and that was my marketing plan all, all along. But right. I, but it's taken a long time um, because we went back to. I don't know if you had a chance to see the slide that I that I had, which was. Um, you know, being and dealing with corporate videos and stuff like that and clients, there's yeah. that saying of you can have it fast, cheap, or good. You got to pick two. Yeah, right? yeah. So, um, with that said, you know, we went down. Uh, I just really briefly talked about like, okay, and for us independents to really compete, we, we can't compete in the same realm of Hollywood or any of those any company that has a marketing ba uh, budget you know behind it because they can make it good and fast but they can't make it cheap that's why you gotta spend a lot of money so for yes. us to go if we want to be good and if we want to be cheap we gotta go slower unfortunately that's just it's almost like the law of physics you know you, can, you can't get anywhere, you can't get around it but there there might be some ways I'll, I'll, I'll address it at the end here um, before we move forward is there any other question or on top of that question well, you want to ask it, it was sort of like because um, I'm starting a new project and I've started to build the website, and I'm start. I've got a Twitter for it, and I've got a Facebook for it, but we haven't really got too much to say about it. And that was part of, like we haven't. We've, the script isn't finished yet, and uh, we've got one actor cast. So I'm like putting things in place. Like you said, it's it's good to start early, but like I'm. What I think happened with Wasteland, for example, was we uh, we finished the film before we started anything because we filmed it mostly in my garage. Um, yeah. And then, um, and then we thought, wow, well, it's actually not. I mean, when we, we we made it, we just decided that we wanted to make a feature film to see how hard it was to make a feature film. And then when we saw it, we thought, actually, this is this is a lot better than we thought it was going to be. <laughs> let, 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 let's see what we can do with it. Um, and and then we started the marketing route, but we didn't really know what we were doing. And so we had some success, but um, I think what happened was the success sort of peaked. And um and then it sort of started dwindling out a little bit because we we got everyone's attention but then didn't do anything with the attention because the the film was like not available online or you know loads of people were asking about where how can they see it but we didn't have anything to show anybody so it sort so I, I don't want to make the same mistake again uh, yeah like um, too many everyone sort of like the critical mass of everybody looking at the project and then not <laughs> having anything to deliver from it because. You know, once that's happened, you, I don't think you'll get it back. Yeah, you know, it's you bring you bring up a really great point, and a lot of the experts that I follow that are online entrepreneurs, there's a saying like, you know, you don't want to squander your la launch. Yeah. And it, it doesn't, you know, you're launching a film, that's a product. Uh, people are launching a software app, or they're launching, you know, all this type of stuff. I mean, and we can look at what Hollywood does, which is you kind of see it. They kind of plant the seed. A little bit with a teaser trailer, or yeah. in, in the trade papers, they release like one or two photos, maybe a, a project coming out that's that may have that may be highly anticipated. Yeah. But uh, from the most films that you never hear about, um, they're in the trade papers for a few people to know what's going on, but the general public doesn't know. And yeah. then it's usually around like a month out, or two, you know, maybe two months, month out, even two weeks out, you just get start bombarded like you know coming in theaters this weekend. Uh, you know, a film starring these people, and you, yeah. you, yeah, I didn't, oh, I didn't hear anything about this film, you know, yeah. and, and based off their metrics or how that stuff uh, is responded to, they can decide whether or not to extend uh, the marketing to get more anticipation for it, and uh, but I, I agree, there is this thing that you gotta um, cherish or be very precious about your launch. Um, 
so that you don't, you know, you can take advantage one level at a time. Like if you get yeah. a boost locally, then how do we take this to the next level and keep moving up? You know, and it's uh, it can be very strategic or it can be very organic. And the problem is we always hear about these stories of like somebody who made something and just like the underdog story, and they get picked yeah. up. It just, and you know, there's an element of luck that we can't ignore. I mean, it's real. Yeah. I mean, that shit happens. So. Uh, for the, for those stories, the problem with filmmakers were such dreamers. We're like, yeah. oh, I dream it, you know, I dream that could happen to me. But the reality is that sometimes you just have to do some, you know, uh, measuring data, measuring the input of the audience, looking at like how large your uh, following is or input, you know, your email list is, and then make a calculated guess, like you know, a small percentage is actually going to really be enthusiastic about it, and then how do we leverage that and keep all our expectations in order and just move forward with that campaign. Um, early on, when you're making a film, which is I'm expo I'm exploring with my uh, my next film as well, and I'm putting together the video series uh, over on YouTube and on on FilmTrooper.com. Is exploring that part of defining the audience, uh, searching out the audience, and really. Uh, in product development, they call it they call it they call it uh, product research. In, certain, right. in terms of when you're asking, you're you're engaging with an um, a group of people that you think your uh, film is going to be really great for, and you don't even mention anything about your film. Like you're just engaging as a like a you're at a party basically, and you're just trying to ask questions and see what people are into. And then you you try to be that person like oh that's really cool I didn't know you were uh, you lived over in Derby as well and you're into zombies yeah. or whatever it might be like you you know what you should check out uh, this guy over here I want you to introduce so you become like this conduit of people in the community where you're connect, connecting other people and you're building goodwill now yeah. you can imagine you do that for a couple months as you're still making your film. Um, but you're not really advertising what you're doing in the film. You you, you have elements. You, there's stuff that you're building, you know, like your daily Instagram or things like that. But you're not really pushing it out there. You're not really marketing because you're still you're going to nurture that launch. And so yes. what happens is that just because you're a good citizen or people know who you are and you're engaged and and you know whatever or you've helped connect other people with other people, you're like a matchmaker, you know, to some extent. Yeah. Um, when you call in that favor, or you, you, it's what Jeff Walker of the Product Launch Formula calls the shot across the bow. It's just okay. a little, it's a little like, oh, hey, you know, oh, it's really cool. I don't know if you guys are interested, but I'm making this film, and um, I want, you, I just want to ask your advice about the title. So then you can have people like, you're making a film, and then like it's like you, you, the whole point is like, yeah, yeah. So then you'll, you just kind of let it organically grow, as opposed to. You know, as a fan, um, if if I became friends with you in a community, I just enjoy the conversations that we have, like in some whatever community that I'm interested in. And then one day you just said, "Hey, I'm I want I, I'm curious what you thought about this title of my film." And I'm like, "Really? You got to film him?" And then I I'm more in, I, obliged to be helpful, yeah. to be a, a, an evangelist for you. So um, that is sort of like a more organic way. And I'll, I'll get to the slides here to kind of show you what I'm talking about. Um, Let's see here. We'll do this. Um, present to everyone. Yeah. So that's your first one. Like when you start marketing, we talk about fast, cheap, or good. You pick two. <laughs> it's going to be cheap and it's going to be good, so it's not going to be fast. So um, you said you had another question with with so many social media platforms. How do you maintain a solid plan? This is in conjunction with also having limited resources. So I say you pick one, and you pick the only one that your targeted audience engages on. And you'll have to do your research to say, man, they really, they really do a lot of the people that I'm think I'm able to sell my film to. That'd be perfect for. They might be on Tumblr. Or, you know, if like you're making like a teen film, I mean, gosh, they're not even on Facebook. They're on like Instagram and Tumblr. You know, but if it's adults, if there a lot of a, a conversations going on, I'm gonna revert back to the zombie film Wasteland, but. You know, there might be a lot of engagement on um, Facebook or, like, I think it's Tumblr. It might be, but you have to do that research. So you pick the one, just one, but if there happens to be more than one, you're like, wow, it doesn't really matter what platform I go on. The, the subject is everybody's talking about it. Then you pick the one that you most enjoy because okay. you got to have fun. You can't, yeah. This can't be – I think marketing 
is this connotation that it's like laborious and painful for filmmakers. But I don't think it has to be. I think it could be really, really enjoyable because you're sending out a message through marketing and you're looking to get a response. Just like filmmakers are like, I made a film, I'm hoping I get an audience to give me a response. If filmmakers can approach it the same way, like in a micro uh, level, that you're just, they're just looking to get responses from the material that you put out there, uh, it could be really useful. Anyhow, so, yeah, you had this question about how do you make changes when things aren't working, and I kind of mentioned um, the world of uh, the lean startup, or when they call pivoting. Like, it's just normal, and business business is messy, too. It's not yeah. very linear, just like the creative process. Like, when things aren't working, don't worry necessarily worry about it, because people may not notice. Or, like, say you built all this uh, marketing materials, and... Um, you know, like you realize it's not working. Then I talked about like the split A B testing. I don't know if you caught that. No. Uh, so I'll, I'll you know, let me go back here. So here's something you could do. I was mentioning in the world of like again online marketing, you talk about the split, the A B split test. And what it, what it happens is you take like your film poster or your movie trailer, and then you know when you put your post on, you can't just like just put like a, a link to an image, you know, without having some sort of title to it, you know, yeah. like some some little message that you put in the post. Well, what they do with the the A/B split testing is just the world of copywriting. So we could put up a trailer for Wasteland or My Movie The Cube, and the headline might say, "Hey, check this out." Like that's like, like the worst spammy headline in the world. Or you can test it with another headline that says, "Whatever you do, don't watch this movie." You know, like, so you're clicking through, you're, the people might be interested, in, like, they're going to just skim through, like, hey, check this out, because it's just spam to them. But they might stop and, like, what do you mean don't watch this movie? So you watch yeah, it, yeah. you know. The, 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 what, you, what you're trying to do is test things on a micro level uh, that don't cost that much, because you're just messing around with copywriting headlines and yeah. how, you know, how it's uh, created. And also maybe your thumbnail or your, your one single image post, you know, how that is seen on social media to grab attention. And those are the things that you are changing and pivoting. Um, so, I mean, one of the, the most famous thing online uh, for Kickstarter was the coolest cooler. And this guy made this ridiculous cooler it was awesome. He combined everything. He had a blender in it, you know, an iPod, you know, stereo. It had like, uh, you know, places for utensils. It had all this crazy stuff, like big wheels. He put a, a a Kickstarter campaign out like in November, and he didn't make his goal. Right? He didn't make it. So he re he reworked his product a little bit and did a better um, um, launch or pitch uh, video and just had some better photos. Not not you know, mind-blowingly, you know, different, but just a little tweaks. Then he launched it right, be, uh, another Kickstarter campaign in um, early summer, and then boom, this thing became the biggest Kickstarter campaign thing ever, like $13 million. He was only going for 100000 and he got like whatever, I think $13 million. So um, I'll send you, I'll put a link to that, all this kind of stuff there in that case study. But that helps you see, like, just because something doesn't work, Initially, maybe it's just a slight tweaks, or when you launch, you know, and when it gets picked up virally, then yeah. it, then it could take off. And I think that's the greatest case study there is out there because it's like, how much different by changing a headline or changing a photo or a video? I mean, was it that much different that it that he went from zero, like he got nothing from his uh, campaign, to thirteen million? Like that's that's why it's so mind boggling. Yeah, but yeah. the same thing can be done uh, with film, I think, um, in terms of uh, the marketing message. And that's where the fun part comes in because it's like a puzzle. It's like, well, damn, you know, they're not responding to this. But if I change this and I add this photo or I do these animated GIFs, boom, I don't know what's happening. Now I'm getting a response. And it's it's like a rush. And that's uh, and that's what you're looking for to enjoy life, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you just want to enjoy life. So let me go back real quick. I want to try to get through your questions. Um, okay, so how do you make changes when things aren't working? Try a split, A, B, split test, or just change your copyrighting headlines and just kind of see what works with the existing artwork or just, you know, change some thumbnails up or there's a lot of things you can do that, you know, to, this, to, to work something out. 
Um, I mean, yeah. is, is, that, is that recommended to do anyway? I mean, because like, yeah, um, like because you're always wanting to grow your audience. So, um, you know, if you're doing those sort of tests all the time, then you, it, it might be reaching audiences that you weren't getting before anyway. Exactly. I mean, the the the, ex, the the ones that are really crushing it online as marketers, this is what they're doing. And there's tools. Right. There's actually tools, software tools, to make it easy for anybody running a business to do it. You know, um, I just haven't done it, or I I don't know. I do it like organically, but you know, I'm not a large enough audience yet to say, okay, now, now let me really test this. What really works and what doesn't work. Hmm. So. The other thing you asked was like, well, how do you get these results with limited resources? And, and again, all comes down to uh, um, defining your expectations. You know, like if we're trying, if we're, if our mindset's like, I want to do meet, reach a level of uh, engagement or transactions that Hollywood is doing. You know, you have to be realistic and go, okay, yeah. but my reality is not this. So my reality is is this on a small scale, local scale, but it does have a a very strong genre, uh, a, a good hook that can be global. So let's just, you know, make sure we understand what our expectations are with our limited resources, and that will help alleviate any alleviate any sort of anxiety, like or disappointment. Like you know, you know how it is. Just kind of uh, mitigate those expectations. Um, you asked, like, how much time do you put into a campaign before we've seen results? Um, again, that all comes back to. What do you want to get out of it? I, I know a lot of us, like you know, um, for you, you and I both, to some extent, um, when we made our film, like this one, I knew I didn't have any expectations. I all I, for me personally, I just wanted to make sure I knew could I do it? Could I make a feature yeah. film for just ridiculously low and without a crew? I didn't even know if I could do it. So I have my expectations were low enough that if I just made my money back, which is considered. Like a you know, success, right? When we think about yeah. films, like hey, he goes, yeah, we made our budget back. Like that's all you hear about in the indie film world. Like yeah, you know, we got all this press and it, it did all these film festival tours and we did well and we, you know, we, we got our, our our investors' money back or we made our money back. You hardly yeah. ever hear, hardly ever hear anybody ever say, I made five times my money back. You know, yeah, it's, yeah. it's never that way. <laughs> So you do the same thing too. You're like you were making like, oh, this is cool. Let's make this feature film. And you're like, wait a minute, this thing is looking a lot better than I expect, and it looks great, by the way. And Thank it's you. just like, and you're like, this is actually coming out pretty good. So what do we do here? You know, <laughs> you kind of need to like break that seal, and like, and it it opens the creative floodgates. You're like, whoa, 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 okay. If I'm able to do this, then what can I do next time? But how do I how do I do better? Even you know, making money off this thing. And that's I think that's where a lot of us are. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so moving forward, you know, how much time you put in a campaign before you see results. Um, I, like, I knew, like, the cube, like, there's only so much at a certain point where I'm not going to do much, you know, marketing for the cube, but I'm trying to lay down the foundations uh, via Film Trooper, building a more uh, sustainable, long term uh, goal with Film Trooper. It allows me to always reference back to the cube, and that's sort of my loose, you know, marketing plan. You know, yeah. it's, not, it's not like I'm going out to people that are interested in, in uh, Buddhism and stuff like that, and, and constantly just you know push this film on to them because there's yeah. only so much I can. There's only so much you can do that before they're like, yeah, yeah. I get it, I get it, you know. <laughs> yeah, I think that's what I was I was thinking is like, um, again, I guess it goes back to defining your expectations of a project. I mean, like, how do you know when that project has gone as far as it can go, and like, um, like it it's not going to get much more attention than that because, like, if it's if it's like six years old and you're still trying to market the same film, you know, it's it's time yeah. to move on. It. And um, I mean, like with the uh, with Wasteland, we've got something like fifty-seven thousand views on that trailer one. Um, and again, for a film that was shot in my garage, for <laughs> I think my shooting budget was nine hundred pounds, which I don't know don't know what what that is in American. That sounds um, yeah. It's not much, but um, yeah, yeah. And um and so. It was it was basically to get it onto IMDb uh, to say that we officially made a feature film and that it was real, um, and then uh, and just to see if we could we could finish it and then like yeah we, we it, when it was getting all this attention we were like okay so how far can we push it and I think it is a it's it's a difficult line to know where that where it is to sort of know how far that project 
can go or has has reached the end of where it should go, and and you should then sort of start using it as a building block for the next project. Yeah, and um, I guess the like you know I knew going in that I wanted to make this thing so dirt cheap, and probably yourself. So you kind of have yeah. to mitigate that. Like, look, I'm gonna push this as far as I can to like, get my money back, or at least say, yeah. to have that notch in my my hat to say, you know what, I was a filmmaker that didn't lose my money. I was yeah. a filmmaker that made my money back, and so. Once that once that goal is reached, boom, done. On to the next one, you know. Yeah. Uh, or you can just say you, yeah, you chalk it up. You're like, you know what, I'm ready to close shop on what I have here. However, you know, if what I'm saying is like, as I build all this other stuff, as you build your audience, you know, you can always go back and say, yes. oh, I don't know if you want to see my first work. Uh, Louis C.K. over here in America, you know, was a, com a famous comedian that famously yeah. has been selling like his DVDs straight to his audience, and he recently dug up an old feature film that he had created years ago that involved yeah, that had like uh, Steve Carell, yeah, and it's apparently terrible, you know, but yeah. it doesn't matter because he, you know, he he was able to take his, the leverage that he built up for all these years and then because he still owned the license or the right to the to this film he was able to sell it directly to his audience yes. so if you think in terms of the, the long term there because it, it's like I think the biggest thing that all of us independent filmmakers need to see is like to answer your question is like these are just one-off products our films yeah. they're just one-off products and realistically they're only advertisements for something larger that we're selling, and yeah. you know, for me, um, I'm still in the messy part of the creative process and the mark in the business process of figuring that out. But it, it, for you too, it's like as you move forward, your company and like you're onto the next project, it does much better. Um, like I said, you're building house, you're building that audience following, you're building, you're finding the people that you want to best serve and best, you know, give them great stuff. And yeah. so over that is the business plan. And I and J Jason Brubaker over at filmmakingstuff.com talks about this all the time. He says uh, the new wave of our business as filmmakers is no longer making films; it's the audience. So our yeah. that is our business model. So meaning that to take it one step further, I'm adding to the lexicon of the interweb. I say let's serve our audience. Like and and I'll talk about that later here at the at the end. But that's going to be our business in terms of the long haul, is to build that that loyalty. And you don't need a million people to follow you or love you. Yeah. And and Kevin Kelly's famous uh, blog post, "A Thousand True Fans," he says you only need a thousand that will give you a hundred dollars a year because they love yeah. you. And that's pretty good, you know. I mean, you know, you can and then you can scale it from there. But the interesting thing is, it's like once I forget where I read it. It's like if you, once you go past like 300 followers or 500 followers, because that, that's sort of realistically how many people you can maintain a true sort of relationship with online, you know. But yeah. once it crosses that magic like 300, 500 people, it gets into this weird phase of like now you have true strangers that are enjoying yeah. what you do. So when you reach the thousands, it's actually easier to go from 1,000 to 10,000 people than it is to go from, you know, 100 to 1,000 or whatever right. it might be. So that's the goal. We're trying to build the long-term goal. So you work on, like both of us, you get to the place where we're wasteland, you're like, you know what, we, we did everything we can. We didn't lose our shirts on it. We have a great thing here. Now we're going to move on to the next one. And then later down the line, if this audience that we built up or this people that we start serving, it's okay to kind of bring it out from the past, you know? Because you might throw like this blog post up later or something where you do... You know, this is what you can do is like this is the fifth anniversary of Wasteland. You know, I can't believe five years ago we made this thing out of my garage, and you know, here's some highlights and funny stories behind it. And people that are following you over five years are like, "You did what? Oh, this yeah. is cool. I'll check it out." So you kind of have to look at it in in that respect of like, okay, there's a long term plan and there's a way to bring it back. You know. Yeah. Um. So, yeah. So let's uh let's uh let's keep cranking here. Okay. Um, I get I get pretty enthusiastic, so sorry. Just no, yeah, <laughs> get start babbling. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, here this is perfect. So this is from coming from Seth uh, Godin, who's a infamous you know entrepreneur and a guru, like a motivational speaker, a marketing guru. 
his book, Permission Marketing, he talks about this thing called interruptive marketing, meaning that everything that we see about the big traditional media has always interrupted us. Uh, commercials. We're watching our show. The reason we got TiVo or DVRs is because we don't want to be interrupted. Uh, radio play, we were interrupted. Movies, and like in the early versions of the web, we kept seeing like pop-up ads and banners. Like anything that these big companies are doing, they're trying to interrupt the flow of the consumer, and that's called interruptive marketing. It's a, it's you're shouting it out. Yeah. And there's a new form of marketing in the last few years that. Is on, that seems to be working on a much loyal, much more loyal basis, which is permission marketing, meaning that you're inviting your audience to come join you on whatever ride or whatever you know product or solution that you're offering, but you're asking permission from them, from the audience, that you can market to them. And marketing again is just a way to communicate what you know what you're selling and and it doesn't have to be sleazy it doesn't have to be like you know shouting at them it could just be a simple conversation so the people that are really killing it right now online um, on a, on these small levels they have invited their um, targeted consumers and audience to join them on their blog posts or whatever it might be and they're just having a conversation with them and then when they start selling something to them it feels organic it, it doesn't feel like you're yelling at somebody so like I said you could be at a online in one of those communities in a part like a party atmosphere where you're just a good person asking questions listening to them maybe connecting them with somebody that you had another conversation with and you're just like a conduit for like good you know uh, goodwill so when it comes time to mention the shot across the bow like hey I've got this film I really love to know what you think about the title then that is like the first form of a gentle permission marketing and so that you know they lead they go down this sales funnel or this marketing funnel where you lead them down to a place where you're like okay we're launching the film uh, be here or pre-order it or whatever it might be and and you know the same amount of work you do for one person is about the same amount of work you'll do for 10,000 people online yeah. You know, but you just have to create a funnel for that. Um, the next question you had was, what size following is needed before working with an aggregator to get on t to the on-demand platforms? That's a really good question. And uh, do I have here? I think it's actually beyond just like your followers. Like, say you, so you had a lot of like uh, YouTube views, you know, or I have, I had just had another interview last week with a Brazilian filmmaker who has like ninety thousand people on the Facebook. Uh, page that liked the film, but I was saying we have got to help you get those 90,000 people or those 50,000 views or whatever might be on your trailer, those people need to be converted to an email list because right. social media is fleeting. You know, I don't know half the things I miss on Twitter because I'm not on it all the time. I only see yeah. chunks and Facebook is the same way. So you, you, you might get a lot of impressions, but the interaction is with email, everybody's got to deal with email. And again, yeah. it goes back to permission marketing. If people if people have given you the permission to market to them, they are willing to you know to do so on the email stuff. Um, okay. So then, so there's a whole process of doing that, but that's your whole goal. It's like, how do I get the the lead generation, the traffic from YouTube, Facebook, and so on, and then get it get them onto my email um, list? And that's a whole you, you just Google that. There's people, te you know, teaching you or sharing, like, um, programs how to do that, like systems, yeah. how best to do that. But once you have that people on your email list, okay, so you have the people on your email list, then you can really understand, like, the numbers. Like, okay, I have 10,000 people on the email list, um, so we can do a um, cost analysis of, does it, does it matter if we go on to um, one of these platforms and use an aggregator? So an aggregation cost, an aggregator will cost you anywhere between sometimes eight hundred to fifteen hundred dollars to get it onto one platform. Say it's iTunes uh, or Netflix or Amazon. So and then some some of them range anywhere from like a hundred to two hundred fifty dollars for additional platforms. So you can spend around twenty five hundred dollars to get your film onto every single platform out there: Google Play, Amazon, Netflix, Hulu, uh, iTunes, all that stuff, right? But um, and then what you want to do is like based on the size of your email list, um, is it cost effective to be on those platforms? You know, so you just say like, well, 
if I have a small engagement, you know, is it worth it spending all that money? Because the reality is, is most people are not going to find your film just because it's on the platforms. They yeah. still have to be. They have to be engaged. They just need to know that it's available on the platforms. But most people don't find, um, you know, uber independent filmmakers or films on those platforms. Those are reserved for those who have relationships with uh, some major distribution companies. So, so then you have to ask yourself: Will a smaller platform suffice? Just, just having it online and then the ease of use for a consumer to like see your trailer and right there on the spot click one button that they can just enter their credit card information and boom they're done and there's so many platforms out there there's Distrify out there in Europe um, and worldwide as well as VHX uh, you know Vimeo on demand is great that way too I mean they just make it simple like here's a low cost entry get your film up we take care of the the interface so that anybody comes to to the site, they see the trailer, they can buy, boom, done. And so you may not even need to go through an aggregator, um, you know. But it's all dependent, all dependent on how big your email list, all dependent on like that email list, your audience saying, "Look, I will buy your film if it's on iTunes, but I don't want to go through any other platform, you know, whatever it might be." So that will help dictate your um, decision making. Okay. The other thing here is conversion rates. Again, this is a a general sort of understanding in the world of web metrics um, and there's a great opportunity uh, or great article written oh God, five years ago by Jason Brubaker in one of his blogs about conversion rates for filmmakers and the reason being is that about one percent one to two percent is actually normal in terms of conversion rates and what that means is going back to this is that if you have um, I saw you there Did you, my internet dropped out. No, no problem. So I'm getting onto this point here real quick about based on the size of your email list, based on the um, you know how much it costs to get uh, use an aggregator, and we'll just putting it on a smaller platform suffice. Um, it all comes down to um, in the web metrics world uh, conversion rates, and the conversion rate is simply like okay, you have 50,000 people that maybe views on the trailer. The reality is is you a safe bet is that you can say that about 1% will actually convert to buy your film. So um, I'm going to stop this real quick so I can, I want to show something. I had this conversation with somebody else. Uh, I'm going to bring up my calculator. Bring up the calculator. So the web metrics deal with conversion rates. And I, I was mentioning that Joyce, Jason Brubaker over at filmmakingstuff.com had a really great article like five years ago where he was like, this is a great metric for independent filmmakers to use when they're you know dealing with investment money or expectations of how well their their film is going to perform. So let's see here. I'm going to use uh, um, where's the calculator? Oh, here we go. Oh, calculator. So we can see my calculator. Calculator. If I can find it. Okay, here we go. <laughs> All right. We're going to say you have fifty thousand. One, two, three. Fifty thousand people view your trailer. If you multiply that by one percent, about five hundred people are most likely going to buy your film. So say you sell your film between you're selling it for ten dollars or renting it for like five bucks. So let's just split the difference, say seven dollars. So you times that by seven, you would make about thirty five hundred dollars, you know? So, and believe it or not, it's pretty close to that. Now, here's a difference. We had um, the film, The Interview, came out with all the scandal from Sony and all the worldwide thing yeah. about the hacks and stuff. So that film famously made like $41 million online. One, two, three. One, two, three. $41 million. Um, they had about 8 million, let's just say for the sake of argument, they had like 9 million views on YouTube of that trailer. So let's see if this, uh, they will have, because they had so much press behind it, they're going to have a higher conversion rate. So, um, you know, say, like, say we have 9 million, 3, 1, 2, 3, so 9 million views. If we times that, um, 
Oh, here's my bad math. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I'm trying to wait. I think it's. I think you do nine million. One, two, one, two, three. Somebody like chime in. I think and then you divide it by forty-one million. One, two, three. One, two, three. Yeah, there you go. So that makes a little bit more sense. So they are about twenty-two percent conversion rate. So if you you go back to like the nine million. One, two, three. One, two, three. And you times it by 22, like 22 percent. Um, is my math bad? That's bad. Somebody help me here. I'm half Asian. I should know this better. <laughs> so bad. I had to, I had this worked out. So I'm doing this live. I'm going live with it. Um, how do you do the metric? I think it's somewhere like they had a conversion rate of like tw uh, 30 percent. You know, but most people, when you're dealing with it, if you look, um, like for instance, my phone, the Cube. Um, it's only had like 3,500 uh, views, right? Uh, trailer views. That's it on Vimeo on demand. So if I times that by, you know, two percent, which is what I'm getting, um, that's not, that's wrong. Look at me. I am so bad at maths. People are like driving their nuts. Let's say 3,500 views times. Okay, yeah, seventy. Okay, so seventy purchases at like seven dollars, seven dollars a pop. I made four hundred ninety dollars. So that's how I made my money back already, because I also had like a a live premiere. That's that's what I was getting at. So right. when we look at that again. So if you, um, yeah, so the numbers are interesting. If and it's all based off transaction numbers. So I had seventy transactions so far for the cube. You know, over time. Again, this is something that nobody knows about it. It's just in a marketing. It doesn't have any major hook to it, but yours being a zombie film and stuff like that, that is a genre people love, and it looks good. So I still think there's a potential of you know making even solid you know money out of it if it's just building a few um, sort of evergreen uh, what they call content marketing that just exists on the internet that you point to every one every once in a while through the through these different um, zombie communities, um, and you might see something like. You know, hundred thousand views, one, two, three, right? Uh, times, let's be conserv uh, better than that. So you get two percent people. So that's two thousand transactions. So two thousand transactions at like seven bucks a pop, you make you know fourteen thousand dollars. Let me tell you something. Um, in the world, I'm gonna go back to my mug real quick. It's interesting enough. Everybody is clamoring trying to get data of like. Because nobody knows like how much movies are actually making on video on demand. Only those movies or films or independent producers that are willing to share the data. Um, that's how people are sort of basing like you know building a business plan. Like, well, if I'm going to go to an investor, like I need to know like how much I'm I'm able to return get get a return on in video on demand. Now here's the problem with the video on demand uh, talk and discussion. The word VOD. Is used as sort of a blanket um, terminology in the blogosphere, but the reality is there's two forms to it. One is the cable VOD, meaning that you can only get on these platforms if you have a relationship with a dis distribution company. So, and then there's another, the other form, which is it's not called VOD. It's actually called electronic sell-through (EST), and that is the straight. Uh, that's the stuff that if you're buying something on iTunes or Amazon or Google Play, that's like the the digital download transactions. Those two worlds, sometimes those numbers get combined and they call it VOD. So then people just the problem is the Uber independent filmmaker thinks like, oh great, VOD is making 41 million for um, the interview, you know. But if you strip it out, majority of the money is made in cable VOD. You take that out, then you're left with maybe, you know, 28 million or something that the um, the interview has made just straight electronic sell through. So the movie costs whatever 75 million to make. They lost money on the film, you know, right. but they're they're going to try to use the um, anticipation or all the the hoopla that went around it to to cut t TV deals, cable TV deals, things like that's how people make money down the line because they're exploiting it, you know, years out. So you yeah. were talking about like, well, when do you end a campaign? Well, I guess you never do, but you just have to always have in the back of your mind like maybe you'll have a one-year anniversary or a two-year anniversary yeah. or things like that. But the thing for 
independent filmmakers with electronic sell-through, it's all based off the transaction numbers. And again, you can do the uh, a basic math of I couldn't do basic math. Obviously, it was evident. <laughs> I mean, I can do it, but it's like, but if you use the uh, the general sales conversions of a two, one to two percent, that gives you a good idea of what to expect. And so, yeah. if you can if you can show like the, this next run of like um, the the film, and you and you have this email list of say ten thousand people, the and even with your email list, your email programs that you use like a, a, a Weber or Mailchimp. You'll see how much engagement. You'll see like, oh man, there's only sixty percent of people actually open the email, or sometimes as low as like twenty, thirty percent. So of that twenty, thirty percent of that ten huge email list, there's only you know thirty percent are really active, and of those active people, there's another percentage that they're may only really willing to buy. You know, it's yeah. really so that kind of calms down the nerves, so it gives you realistic expectations. Um. So moving forward, I don't know if that helps, but th that's that's sort yeah, of the yeah, yeah. yeah, no, that's, that's a. I think that's kind of what we were trying to do, but like, it's one of those things where unless until somebody says it, you kind of go, ah, now that makes sense of what we were doing and why what we were doing wasn't working when we tried this and and uh, and actually why what we were doing was working for a while, and then when we deviated for, from that, it suddenly went wrong. So no, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it's a. Uh... Yeah, you know it's funny. Like, I'm pretty. I'm I'm aware of like what works and what doesn't work now. And but there's a whole reality of the actual application of your knowledge. Yeah. You know that's and that's something we'll get into here, because like I know like there's certain things I could do to make this better, but there's only so many things during a day that I can do. So I have to optimize yeah. and say, you know what, I know how to make this thing sell better, but I, I'm choosing not to address it because I'm putting my focus on something else, you know, and that's just the reality of like every day you're going to be juggling around like, does this get me closer to my goal? And that's why having really defined goals and realistic goals, well, every step that you make uh, can get you there further and faster. Um, yeah. As opposed to like you know you're meandering back and forth like I, I'm kind of getting there but not as yeah. much of a straight line you know. <laughs> I, think, I think sometimes we 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 were too scattergun. We, we yeah. weren't giving some of the changes enough time to see results before changing it, and so we were we were going off in multiple directions and and confusing people to some degree. And I think that's something that with the next project will will be. Um, it, it's like slowing it down, you know, that you were talking about before, where you you do something, you implement a change, you give it time to 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 an, a, analyze the results of those things to see actually if we do need to change something, or like you were saying, with just doing different ta uh, posts on social media with different uh, titles and things like that. And I think uh, the changes we were implementing were were too big. Um, to, and then it was sort of confusing the brand of the the, the project, and 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 that's where we lost uh, some of the momentum to, to for the project a bit. Yeah, it's interesting. It's uh, hearing the story. I mean, um, like I mentioned, like Jason, who's a friend of mine, Brubaker. He, his whole story too is they made a zombie film, and they helped. They didn't realize they had built up this huge following online, and and. Um, they realized they could start making money online selling the DVDs. It was by sort of happy accident. It was only until afterwards they were like, "Oh my God!" We looking back now, they're like, "We had a huge opportunity because we had a, a larger, you know, hype, the peak interest." And it's yeah. like, and you know, sometimes that happens when you're not ready. And so that's where you're getting you kick yourself because you're like, "I okay, if I could get ready next time, like, how can I catch yeah. in?" So, but it, it definitely happens to a lot of people. So, um, I'm gonna jump in real quick uh, on the. Presentation yep. because I think we get into uh, more of this stuff. Let's see here. Yeah, so here's the, you. You had a question. It's like, what is the realistic goals for a project between the budgets? You know, five hundred and ten thousand. You know, I'm just going to throw that out there. Like, we because a lot of a lot of filmmakers that I think are watching this are in that range. You know, they're not making yeah. half a million. They're not making a million dollars. And what do I have here? Okay. My next, your next question was, when nothing happens when working with a distributor, how can I do better on my own? Okay, so I think this all kind of goes back and forth because it's like, okay, we're talking about projects that are in these really low range, and we're talking about 
you know, if you get an opportunity to work with a distributor, like meaning like if you sign a deal with a distributor and you realize nothing's happening, you're like, ugh, well, what can I do? Why can't I do something on my own that would do better than what a distributor would? And um, we're going to go back to the big word, which is incentive. Again, based off this uh, takeaway I got from this book, uh, Freakonomics, um, which is fantastic, is that all humans are motivated by incentive. So when you're dealing you know, with your child or your kid, you know, when they, their incentive is like, I don't want to brush my teeth or go to the bathroom or take, you know, go, you know, take a shower or something like that. So or or go to bed. So you're you try to incentivize them by giving them candy or some kind of gift, you know, so they're motivated by the incentive. So the same thing happens with a business deal. Um, business deals, because we have to understand what the incentive is for a distributor. And what usually happens is the world of distribution right now is in turmoil because the reality is film products, the, the value of it is just dropped because, you know, supply and demand. There's so many film product out there and not enough demand. And uh, there was a discussion by the experts that, um, that said that today's filmmakers, we're not just competing against what's coming out this year. We're competing with all of the history of cinema that's at the fingertips of, our, of the audience. I have friends that still watch like old movies and old TV shows. I mean, that's what they're really into. They're not even watching the newest thing. Yeah. So it's like with so much content coming out, you know, how do you, how do you compete? And so a distribution company is like, okay, whoa, whoa, like what do we do with this stuff? Like, and here's the big thing, you know, Netflix has just launched in a lot of foreign countries because they, you know, obviously started here in America, um, but they just released like in South America and Australia, and that's going to just, that's going to de decimate really the role of a dis distribution company because, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, well, what is a what is a distribution company doing if they're not distributing physical goods? Like if they don't have an infrastructure, if they're just taking your digital file and they're uploading it to the same platforms that you can upload to, which is why the rise of the aggregator is working, is because yeah. the aggregator is like, we're just a service. We take your film, make sure it has the technical specs, and we put it up on those platforms. It can sell, it cannot sell. We don't care. You know, I mean, yeah. you know, to be, to, you know, to be fair, but you know. I think that the evolution of the distribution company needs to turn into a marketing company, but a lot of them just grab your, for the uber independent filmmakers in the range that we're talking about, a lot of distribution companies will grab it, like, okay, I want your zombie film, because I need to get nine other zombie films. So my job as a distributor is like, I'm going to grab ten of these zombie films. Now I've got more collateral, so I've got ten low budget, you know, zombie films, and I'm going to sell this package to another distri distributor that has, you know, larger, you know, outlets or something like that. And so I'm going to sell it all off for like $100,000. Now here's the thing is like if the deal that I make as a distributor, my incentive is to say, look, I don't know if your film's going to do really well, but I think it can if I put it in this package of other films and I can sell the package better than just your one film alone. And um, I'm not going to give you any advance, but like if it does really well, then all the back end numbers, that's how you're going to get paid. Well, what happens, you think about the distributor, like, I didn't make anything. All I'm doing is hustling. I'm, a, I'm hustling to try to convince people that did all the hard work to, like, let me have the rights to bundle their, their film with other films and sell it off, you know. And so when they sell it off, there's really no, you know, they might have done a few bit of uh, some phone calls, so maybe some a little bit of marketing to the, the, the eventual buyers, maybe, a, you know, a trip to like can a trip to like uh, the AFM or something like that. Um, so there's travel costs that they basically take out of any profits that you might get. You know, so that's how the the wishy washy math happens in distributors. So they sell ten films, a packet of ten films to somebody else for like say a hundred thousand dollars. So like, okay, that was a good payday. You know, it didn't take me much. I didn't make any of these films. I had no skin in the game. I didn't pay out any advance. I just I basically signed a contract and I flipped it. And this is exactly what the world of um, real estate investors or flippers or house flippers do. Because <laughs> this is here. This is this was crazy. Just so you get a better idea. So in the world of real estate house flippers, what happens? They see a a, a property that that's not going to sell in traditional means of like. Uh, 
getting like a mortgage, getting a realtor in a nice home, you get in. It's like a piece of crap home that needs renovation, right? So the thing is, is that real estate investor needs to get that property under contract. They pay nothing. All it is is a contract that says, I will buy that piece of crap property for $50,000. And what they do is they find another investor that has the money to, to uh, basically renovate the house, refurbish it to sell it so, so they can sell it for a higher cost. All they do is they take that contract and they flip that contract, assign that contract to somebody else for $60,000. So if they bought, if they had a contract for fifty thousand and they sold it, saying that it's worth sixty thousand, they get the difference of ten thousand dollars. Right. And they didn't do anything, and they just basically were the person who who secured it in a deal and transferred it over, so that the person who bought it for sixties has the means to like do the renovation, and then they sell it for like a hundred thousand, where they would make you know, or one hundred twenty thousand. So that's where they make the thirty, forty thousand dollars per property. So the world of Film distribution is the same way. So you get like somebody who doesn't do any of the work says, I'm just going to put it under contract and let me do the work of bundling this all together, selling it off to another distributor for $100,000. That's what I get. And guess what? The, the deal, like because $100,000 and all the, the accounting, um, it cost me you know $50,000 to do all the travel to make the sale and I'm taking that out. Uh, against you know the filmmakers and say you know what we sold it and now it's out of my hands we're hoping to see some return so that's how like you'll never see any action as yeah. filmmakers you know your filmmakers are like wait where's my advance I didn't get an advance or wait where's my um, back end and they look at like all the back end against the expenditures that a distribution company said they were using but that's how they're making their their money it's like okay I made fifty thousand hundred thousand. I'll do it again. I'll go to film festivals. I'll, I'll look around. I'll I'll just bundle genre films together, put it together, and I'll flip it over to some other distributor who can you know use yeah. it or not use it. And the filmmakers will never ever see. Uh, there's that case that's going on right now with Gravity, uh, the screenwriter and author who's suing um, the studios because she had sold this this project that is essentially gravity to New Line Cinema that went out of that went bankrupt and that who got bought up by Warner Brothers or whatever. But because that company got bankrupt, there's no legal recourse that that right. writer can get through gravity. So the exact same thing happens with filmmakers. Like you don't you don't know you sign a deal with a distributor, that deal gets sold to so many other distribution companies and there's no way that you'll be able to like retrieve any money unless you sue. Right. Which is and nobody then at that point, like I don't know where the where the where's where's the accounting going on any of this stuff, so that's really why historically filmmakers of of this range, when I say budgets between five hundred to ten thousand, fifty thousand dollars, have had such horror stories about the distributor because they expect they were expecting more and they're not getting that treatment, you know. So I'm sorry that was a long winded thing, but I just wanted to. Oh, I I lost him. Look, at, I I talked so much I I blew him off the offline. So <laughs> I'll keep going. Here. Um, there you are. Yeah, drop that again, sorry. No, no, my, my bad. I, I said I was speaking so much that I just knocked you right off. <laughs> <laughs> no, the internet's really not very good. You're doing fantastic. Um, but yeah, so that's the story because I can understand your um, disappointment with sort yeah. of just the distribution deals. That are being offered and um, and the performance. I think when we went into it, we kind of went into it as well. We're probably not going to get anything from it. It's more of a again like our expectations were. We made a film in the garage that was supposed to our our aims were to get it finished and to, to IMDb. So having it go, go to a distributor was like way above what we were ever expecting. So it was more we kind of thought of it as more of a learning curve. Um, and a lesson to learn. Okay, it might have proved to be quite a costly one because that distributor may make a lot of money off the, the the film, and we may never see anything. But at the same time, we know that next time we won't be doing that, or if we do, we'll be going about it a different way. Yeah, yeah. It's a it's that's a still an accomplishment. Everything you've done yeah. is like you, it's feather in the cap. It feels good, and but now then it's funny because after you do like one or a few like that, you're like, okay, now let's get down to business. Like yeah. how can we? Because I we know we have the skill set, we can do this. But how do we be more strategic to do you know 
better business wise. Um, yeah, and that's that's fun. Um, because it, it it energizes you like okay, like game on. Let's let's make it yeah. happen. <laughs> okay, so the next thing, real quick, go through the slides. You would ask like, do I need a fully realized plan before I start? And um, and your last question is, well, how do you stay relevant to all of this? So I think all these, both these last two questions actually kind of work together. It's like, do you need a plan before you start? And how do you stay relevant? Well, like I said, there's a lot of people talking about audience, audience, audience. Uh, know your audience, build your audience. Your you know audience is your business. I'm I'm coming to the realization that you have to serve your audience. And when I say serve your audience, it means that when you put yourself in that mental state of being a servant to your audience, you let go of all ego, so you're not this film auteur that needs to push your your ideas or your creative you know work out onto an audience, as opposed to deciding a group of people that you would really love to hang out with and you would really love to create something for them. And that puts you at a much, I don't know, maybe Buddhist Zen place state of mind of like, I will be a servant to you because I think I have enough talent to make something that you would really like. Um, so I will be a servant to you. Um, let me hear. Oh, yeah, I want to see that one for last. So... The interesting thing about this concept of serving your audience as opposed to building your audience or knowing your target audience, because it sounds very predatory, you know, like you got to build it, you got to know it, you got to sell to them. Sell the, it's just, there's a lot of companies out there that don't give a crap about their customers, you know, but if you're going to be in this for the long haul and we want to be good citizens and things like that, you realize, like, I've come across some filmmakers that have made films, but, you know, they're the fans that are really you know, are really digging the stuff they're working on, they may not be the. Um, they're finding themselves like I don't know if I really like the fans, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so prior to going into it, then maybe we should ask the deeper question: Is well, what sort of fans would I love to hang out with all the time? What fans would I love to serve all the time? Who, like who are my people? Who are, like and Seth Godin talks about who are your tribe, and so you. You answer those questions ahead of time, and then you're like a good community member. Like I said, early on, you're just having conversations because you enjoy the conversations anyway. And then when it comes time to make something for them, then again, you're at this this place of not um, – you're not self-absorbed. Your, 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 your ego is left out of it, and you're just like, look, I am a servant to you people. you know. And that's what I've discovered with Film Trooper is an opportunity to meet people like yourself like – I'm trying to get make sure that Film Trooper has a very narrow message, so I'm not dealing with like uh, necessary newbie filmmakers that have uh, aspirations of like getting the latest camera gear, and they're going to just do the you know because they're just they're so hard up about like what lens to use, the you know full frame, half frame, whatever it might be, you know, and they're looking towards like getting discovered, like their dream, yeah. still in that dream stage. I really enjoy those who are like that I'm finding on Film Trooper, the ones who are really um, responding or those who are like, look, I made something, you know, I I think I could do better. I think like what are the hardcore questions? Like how do we make this work? Like they're 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 inquisitive and they're curious. And that has weeded out a lot of the sort of looky loos or like, you know, online some of the other uh, blogs because you know there's a lot of more popular blogs obviously that focus on the dream, you know, because you're selling them the dream. This stuff is like, there's no dream. We're just pushing it away. But there is a dream of reality and, and possibly a practical way of handling this. And so the people I get a chance to meet have this discussion. And so I find myself beholden to uh, the community because it's like, well, damn, now I'm all in. Like, I enjoy all these questions. I enjoy trying to help find those answers or find direction. And I find that's actually invigorating me. And so I see the same way as like if I'm going to make the next film, well, the, what other type of audience that I like to engage with that I can do my best to create something for them? And there was a I remember having this conversation on Twitter with somebody, and they said, wait, if you're going to serve your audience, then doesn't that mean that you're um, not going to make the film that you want to make? And they were like, th that was their mentality. It was like, if I'm, yeah. if I'm going to be a servant to some other audience, then... I'm not going to be able to make the kind of film that I want to make. 
Well, then I thought about it. I was like, well, listen, if you're not going to be really into your audience, it's going to be pretty transparent. You know, people are going to know that you don't really care about them, because then it's all about you and all about you and your 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 vision. And guess you know what? Ha this is a perfect example of what happened. George Lucas. George Lucas made Star Wars and changed the world, the cultural. But it, when it came down to the such animosity towards the last three films he made was because he didn't engage with his audience. You know, yeah. like, he knew, but if you hear those early interviews, he's like, yeah, it's my film. I don't care. I'm going to do what I want to do. Yeah. Which is interesting because, well, the audience responded. Uh, versus Pixar, when they made the first Toy Story movie, they had this different collective mindset that says, you know what, we gave birth to the characters of Buzz and Woody, but they're no longer ours. It's like, it's the world's. And so now, moving forward with the next two films, we have to respect that. Like, we can't just be this auteur mindset of like, I don't care, I'm going to do the way I see it, my vision. There's this respect to what the audience or what characters they gave out to the world. And look what happened. A much better film, you know, came out of it. So... To answer that particular uh, filmmaker's concern was like, if you serve your audience, are you not going to be able to make the film that you want, your vision? No, it's complete opposite. And um, and I, th I think George Lucas is a perfect example of what you can do at the height in terms of giving people what they want or what they're not expecting, and also completely on the other side of like, ah, you kind of, you kind of just became, you know, I don't know. Somebody actually said it the best. They said the the prequel films of Star Wars, his films were like the best, like the ultimate fan Star Wars films. You know, because a lot of people make star, f this, uh, fan films. Yeah. <laughs> like, that that was his version of the fan film. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, so, so that's one thing, because that helps your the, the mental state of where you're going with all your projects moving forward. And even for yeah. me too. So the next film I'm making, I'm literally looking at it like, how can I be a servant? How can I be a great community member to this, these people that I want to make a film for? Because if I know if I take care of them, you know, reciprocity, I can't say it. Uh, my English is terrible, even though it's my first language. Um, reciprocity, yeah. The, 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 the act of you giving a lot that people feel obliged to give back later. Yeah. So, and that is honestly, I'm not coming with any of this stuff. I mean, all this stuff is just, stuff that I've been reading for years, and I'm just curating. I'm just connecting all the dots. Like, okay, if this is working for other successful online business people, how can it work for the filmmaker? And yeah. But the difference is understanding the psyche of the uber-independent filmmaker. Like, ah, I just want to make something. I just, I, This is enjoyable. I love the process of making something, and I, and I love getting a response from some people. But how do I systemize it? How do I do better? How do I make a business out of it? How can I make this my living? And that is... Um, you know why we're here. So I'm going to show you something real quick that may help everyone, which is a technique, a strategy used by all sort of online entrepreneurs that are successful. It's called um, it's the drama. As I <laughs> the dramatic pause as I try to get over to the slide, it's not very not very smooth. It's called joint venture or JV, and the concept here of the joint venture JV is simple. You have to leverage, you have to join forces with somebody that has a much larger influence or audience. So you're say you're say it's a zombie film. Say somebody's running the best Walking Dead blog out there. You know, they, they, they like they're the experts of all things Walking Dead. Um, you know, maybe it's the Nerdist or whatever they have the the Talking Dead. You know, the, those types of shows. Um, that's like the height of it. You know, what you're trying to do is there's a saying like if you want to be the leader of a parade, then you just jump right in front of the parade. You don't wait to start your way from the very back to move your way up to the parade. In order to get there quicker, you just got to jump up and f jump in front. And the way you do that is by doing joint venture, um, JV partnerships. So in order to be more effective with your time and your resources, it's like, okay, I can serve an audience or I can be a good community member, which is part of it, but really I also have to be a great supporter of those people that have a, the, the audience that I want to get to. So if, say somebody has like a huge blog about zombies or you know they have a huge influence of, of those types of things, 
you do whatever you can to over time to connect with that influencer. Uh, and maybe they're selling a book, or maybe they're making a movie, or or they're sell, they're they're doing something that they need um, uh, evangelists out there. If you become an evangelist, if you become somebody out there, it's like, oh, cool, you're making the top 100 zombie movie book that you're put you're coming out on Kindle or Amazon. Like, I will help you promote it, you know, or like. And you're not asking for anything, but what they're happening is that influencer is looking at you, going, "Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you so much for helping us out, you know, for that final push." So when it comes time, like, "Thank you, yeah, it's awesome. It's been a great time. It's great to see people already take response to this book or whatever you're selling or this blog post you put out." And then when it comes time, it says, "You know, hey, I have a question. I, I'm making my the zombie film, and I was wondering what you thought about the title." You know, so it's, it's, now it's a shot across the bow to this very um, influential person. So what happens? Um, uh, I saw you there. So what happens by gently asking them? They already feel obliged because if you help them sell something, or you help them be a good community member, or evangelize what they do, um, they're going to be obliged. To like, I'll take a look at your film and your title, and then you have this conversation. So when it comes time to like actually sell it, you're like. You come up with a plan called a joint venture plan. Like, look, I'm about to release this thing onto one of these digital platforms, and you can get 100% of the sale if you help me promote it, and I'll give you a link, or you get 50% of the sale. So then all of a sudden, the guy has all this influence. Like, I like you. I know who you are. You helped me out. Um, I like the project you're doing. Um, yeah, and and I get to get paid like because I built a huge following or audience or something like that. I can help get paid to send it out to my list um, and get half off or, or get you know 50 percent of the commission. Sure, you know those. That is the fastest way that anybody online is doing anything is partnering up with the right partners. Okay. Um, yes, yes, they are building their own audience, but they're also partnering up with the right, right partners. And that's a problem right now with film, the independent film landscape, is because the distribution companies don't have really any major leverage that way. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's, like, it's not like an audience is going to, you know, A24 site or Gravitas or they're going to, like when we think about, you know, there's studios out there, but it's not like, oh, man, I love all the Warner Brothers films. They have a style. They have a voice. Like, whatever they do, I trust. Like, that is the biggest problem right now in the landscape of independent film is that they – there's no trusted sort of resource, so that's why they have to res resort on bloggers or people that are, that are real people online, you know, tweeting, yeah. you know, that's the people that you want to target. And I'm just finishing up this next video for how to make a movie film trooper case study that delves into, like, well, how do you find that or, like, how do you find the influencers or audience and things like that. Um, so that'll, that'll be later. But that's one thing to take away from everything here. It's like, just be realistic about what you can do on your time and try to be organic about it, but be real realistic about it. Whether yeah. you're going fast, you know, you're, you're going to be doing cheap and good, you know, so it's going to be slow. But you can get there faster if you focus some effort on some major influencers and do what you're, you can to eventually uh, the, your goal, like, you know, a year out. You know, maybe you do something great for this person, you know, every month, every week for a year. Until you finally cash, you're gonna you make that call. You know, you make yeah. that email that says, "Now I the shot across the bow. Now I need your help." You know, <laughs> and that's yeah. honestly how everybody that I follow online that have big successful online businesses, that's what they do. And and once you figure once we figure that out, you're like, ah, I get it, I get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that makes that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So like, say again, like say I had a huge. Like say Film Trooper was massive, you know, whatever had a lot of influence, and then you were like a big supporter, and I, I came out with a film or a product, you helped me do it, uh, take care of it, and then say you come around the time that you were ready to make your own film, I'd be like, oh yeah, let's take a look at it. You you can kind of see just how that works, you know? Yeah. And um, vice versa. So, and that's about that's about it. This is a uh, yeah. I don't know if you have any other uh, further questions. Uh, just for I know it was a, a marathon of me talking, but yeah. No, no. Uh, I, yeah, it's got uh, got a lot to take in, a lot to think about. Um, I mean, yeah, like I said before, a lot of what you said it, it it makes sense, and also I can see how applying it to what we've done in the past, it makes sense 
to where we've succeeded without knowing about it and where we've failed and, and not knowing about it. Um, so, yeah, it's sort of helped uh, help me figure out what, what we did in the past and hopefully now if I can uh, work it out again, be able to uh, improve on, on everything for the next project. Yeah, so I, since I have no idea what your next project is, I, I think the only actual items, like say it's like a part-time effort that you, that you can do the marketing. And I, I think the thing is, is moving forward, I think filmmakers need to not see that marketing and the filmmaking are two separate things. Like the, we have to start seeing it as all, it's just part of the process. Just as like we were learning, you know, the script writing phase is part of the process, you know, post-production, all that kind of stuff. The, the marketing is not like a for, uh, an afterthought. It's it's literally part of the process, and it can be yeah. really fun. It, it, here's what, now, here's what's crazy real quick. Um, there's a buzzword going on with marketers right now. They're all saying that in order to be a better marketer in today's world, you have to be a great storyteller. So marketers are learning more about the hero's journey, Joseph Campbell. They're learning about story structure. Marketers are learning how to become better storytellers. Yeah. What's crazy is that filmmakers, if that's the case, should be amazing marketers. Yeah. But we're not. A lot of them aren't. So we have to get over that mindset that somebody's going to take care of our own our film for us. That yeah. we have to nurture it and that we have to be better storytellers in our communication process when we're talking about our film. And again, that's where the fun part of like, you know, if you choose what, figure out what one platform you're going to spend your time on. Twitter, Tumblr, Instagram, Facebook, whatever that is, learn everything you can about it so that you can best communicate with your audience and then have fun doing those little tests of like yeah. something outlandish like, do not, you know, whatever you do, do not watch this video. Or do whatever you do, do not reply back to this this um, photo. So it's like a thumbnail that, yeah, yeah. that is so controversial. You know, like, you know, all women should be in the kitchen. Or something, I mean, something ridiculous. I don't know. I, I mean, not, you're, what you're trying to do is incentivize people to emotionally get invested. We're like, oh, screw it, i got to leave a comment, you know. Yeah, yeah. Or, um, and one of the, the biggest tricks is just asking questions. Like, what do you think of this film title? Or goes... Or what's your favorite way of watching a film, you know? Or what's your um, or your top five favorite films, or or so, I don't know something like that. Anything you can to get people to engage with you. In the process of that um, engagement, you'll get some of the answers you're looking for of how best to base market to them, to communicate with them, to eventually sell to them. Yeah. Um, and so that's yeah. Pick one platform and then start eyeballing. Or if you don't know who the influencers are in the space that you're going to be selling your film or you're targeting your film to, what audience? If you don't know who they are, ask your audience. Like, who do you trust more? Like, you just have a photo. Do you trust yeah. um, this person versus this person? And just because you're trying to figure out like who has uh, more cachet in that space. And so from there, then you can go. Okay, well, this person has more uh, people trust more. I'm going to do everything I can to connect with that person over time, help them promote or sell anything so that I can cash in and offer a joint venture opportunity. So then yes. you become much more strategic in that sense um, and much more effective. Yeah, no, it's, yeah, it makes sense. Hey, man, I know you hung, on, hung in there with me. You got bad weather. Uh, you got kids, uh, sick kids, and <laughs> all that kind yeah, of it's stuff. All, it's all happening. So, yeah, the real world. Um, yeah. It was a really a pleasure of for you, you know, connecting with me and, and having this opportunity to come on and uh, share all your questions and allowing me to blab so much. But I, I really had a great time, so thank you. No, yeah, same, same. It's uh, like I say, it's, it's great to, to talk to people who are, and, and expand the, the areas that you work in. Yeah, very cool. So um, I just have to do some uh, quick um, housekeeping in terms of. Um, this is my way of paying the bills. <laughs> uh -huh. So real quick, so at the end of these things, I always end it with, um, if anybody stuck around this long for an hour and a half conversation about film marketing, and if you're still struck, struck, stuck trying to make your film, then I invite you to go over to freegearguide.com where you get an equipment list of everything that I use to make my feature film, The Cube, which was made for $500 with no crew. Again, that's at freegearguide.com. And um, and here's the thing I do. This is this is this is my my opportunity for uh, uh, a commerce, which is 
I'm hoping that people are engaged enough. They're like, you know what? Here's the permission. I'm going to give you my email. That's that's what I'm going to give to you because I want this free gear guide, and I'm interested in what you you have to say. They're give you know the consumers are giving me the um, the permission, um, and that's sort of the tactics used. So like you have to create something for your that is in in alignment with whatever your message of your film is. That you give away something free, and that's the permission. That's sort of the exchange. It's the first first step in building a relationship with your audience. And so I'm here trying to get other filmmakers that are serious about things, um, where I can help explore these questions for them. But in the meantime. No sweat off their back. No sweat off my back. Here it is, a free equipment list. Won't take you like it's not like a ma massive ebook that they have to read 300 pages. It's just like a quick guide. They're like, oh, this is what he used to make his little film. I have the same things, or I have better equipment. I should be able to do something even better. You know that kind of thing. So that's what we do. That's why I do it at the um, offer it up at the end of every session. Is go to freegearguide.com and that's it for Film Marketing Fridays. Thanks for everybody who stuck. In with, in with me for this long, and that's it. That's the end of the broadcast.